Well, it's taken two years and 77 episodes to get to it, but your long wait is over. This week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we finally discuss the most advanced, most complex, and most expensive fighter aircraft ever designed. But it may also be the most capable, as we learn from our guest, United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel and Test Pilot, Tucker Hamilton. I think the bread and butter of the F-35 that other platforms can't do in a stealth manner is to be able to know where a target area is, go use their radar to kind of map that ground from really far away, on that map, find the targets, and then going in in stealth capability and dropping weapons and egressing safely and doing all of that with embedded sensors. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome to the show. I am your host, Jello, and joining me once again as guest co-host this week is retired United States Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel Dave Burke. Chip, welcome back to the show. It's good to be back, man. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, no doubt. It's been a little while, so we're talking about the F-35 today, and just as a refresher, let's see if I get this right. Former Marine fighter pilot, did some Navy boat time, went to Top Gun, flew the F-16, and let's see, if I didn't say it, you were a Hornet guy, and then went and did a tour with the F-22 with the Air Force, came back, did the F-35. Of course, you did some Anglico stuff in there, but uh, what did I miss? No, I think, I think you got it covered, man. I got to fly uh, <laughs> four pretty cool fighters, uh, finish my no career doubt. with the F-35 as well, so yeah, spot on, man. All right. 20 years all wrapped up in 15 seconds. Sorry, <laughs> right I'm, I'm sure it was a bit harder. Anyway, dude, it's been a little while. And as you and I are recording this on April 10th, 2020, has been quite a bit of change in the last month. How have you been handling this stay-at-home thing? Uh, you and your family, your professional endeavors, what's going on? Well, we're doing okay, man. I appreciate you asking. Most importantly is uh, everybody's healthy and safe and we're well positioned to kind of ride this thing out. We're following the guidelines. We're doing the best thing we can do is, is just uh, continue to do the smart things to keep us uh, through this as fast as we can, man. But we're doing all right. I really appreciate you asking. Good. Well, yeah, I'm glad. It's obviously a challenge for everybody. I can't think of a person or a industry that's not affected by this COVID pandemic thing in some way or other, but everyone seems to be coping. And I've checked with some other co-hosts in the past. Sunshine says he's doing well. I checked with him, checked with some of our past guests. Most people are trying to do what they can, I guess. That's good to hear, Matt. Yeah, for sure. In other news, but I don't really want to drop anchor on it too much, is I think everyone who's familiar with what's going on with the USS Theodore Roosevelt, uh, with the relieving of its CO, who's a good friend of mine, two squadrons together, he was the presiding and guest speaker at, at my uh, retirement ceremony. There's obviously a lot of hubbub about all that, but I think we'll save that for another venue some other time. And, and Chip, you and I can talk about it offline, I'm thinking. Heck, that could be a full episode, I'm sure. Well, and again, there's a lot to it. We don't know everything. We just know what the media tells us. But That's right. Until I get all the facts, I'm trying to reserve judgment. All right. I just want to make one quick announcement regarding last week's episode, the Boneyard. The folks at the 309th Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group, they reached out to let me know and everyone else that the aircraft that's been in the storage the longest is in fact a TA-4B model, not a J model, as was stated. And that aircraft, get this, Jeff, has been there since October 31st, 1969. Wow, that's crazy, man. Yeah. Do you ever have a chance to get out there? I did, man. That place is incredible. Uh, when I went through F-16 transition training, I did it at the uh, Air National Guard, which was on station at Tucson International Air airport. Ah. And uh, while I was there, we got a really cool tour, just me and a couple other guys. It was a blast, man. That place is uh, kind of unreal. Uh, really once in a lifetime, uh, hands-on experience for me in the Boneyard. Very cool. Yeah, good stuff. It was fun to get out there. I'd never done it during my career, but thanks to the podcast, I had a chance to go out there and poke around. And it was pretty cool. I saw the very first F-18B I'd ever flown in uh, VMF-AT 101 back no in the No way. Day, so. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good to go put a hand on that old girl. I may have done the same airplane, so we should, I should go check it out again. Probably so. Anyway, buddy, hey, so I got a bunch of listener questions, but we have a longer interview today, and 
I don't know. I think we just better get to the F-35 interview. But there is one question I want to pose to you because this is kind of in your space. It's from Richard from Vancouver in British Columbia. And he says, in episode one, you describe fighter pilots as type A individuals. I get it, but I have to say that you and your guests all around sound pretty affable and pleasant with a lot of emotional intelligence. I'm guessing the culture encourages that. How does military aviation get high-performing type A individuals in a competitive environment to get along together productively with each other and with those doing the support jobs? I get the impression that it's not like the culture in high-stakes litigation where aggression and competition often bring out the very worst in people. And Chip, I say you have a part in this space because with your other uh, ventures now after the military, you get out and talk to folks about subjects like this, do you not? No, absolutely. I think it's an awesome question. Uh, I really like the way he worded it, and I think it's pretty cool that he's making the connection to maybe the world he's into. Mm -hmm. Look, you know, you probably ask 10 people, getting 10 different answers. I think that type A competitive behavior and that mindset is what drives people to naval aviation and drives people, I think, to a lot of difficult, challenging environments that people want to find themselves in. But when he talked about this idea of being kind of affable and, and more importantly, being emotionally intelligent, you know, that's an attribute that we have to learn. I don't think anybody would describe me as emotionally intelligent as an 18-year-old or a 25-year-old even wanted to be a fighter pilot. That's something that I learned. Mm. And I think he's right. I think the culture requires you to learn that, you know, being type A and being aggressive is awesome. And I think we all need to be able to reach into that to utilize that mindset that we have, especially in difficult environments. But if you can't, you know, get along with your peers, if you can't recognize that the people around you may be a little bit different and the way you interact with them has to be a little bit different, you're going to have a hard time in a squadron. You're going to have a hard time in the Navy, the Marine Corps, any service in general. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that capacity to lead and that capacity to be uh, emotionally intelligent and pleasant is everything. Every bit as required is that capacity to dig deep down into your core uh, and be as aggressive as you need to be to win in combat or anything else. So it's a really cool question. And I think that attribute and those behaviors, they apply everywhere. And the ones that do it the best are most successful, regardless of what industry they're in. Yeah, I agree, Chip. And I would say the counterpoint to that is those who practice scorched earth policy to your point, don't really get very far because yeah. they're going to be shut down quickly. Now, we've all seen some leaders that do that, whether they develop that later or whatever, and it's usually not the folks you want to work for. And so there are exceptions, I think. But for the most part, Richard, great question. And yeah, everybody figures out a way. And, and the other thing I would say is you can't have a scorched earth policy and continue to fly if you treat the people like dirt who are keeping your airplanes ready because, oh, by the way, they could sabotage you if you're really that much of a dirt bag. So it's self-preservation as much as anything. Yeah, I think the scorched earth policy, I've worked for a few people like that. I've seen it. Yeah, sometimes they slip through the cracks here and there, and those are rare events, but they certainly happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd say, you know, the vast majority of people, the ones that are the most successful are the ones that figure out how to interact with other people. You know, that's an attribute that, like I said, is important no matter what you're doing. All right. Well, thanks for the help with that, Chip. And again, we have plenty more listener questions. They'll have to wait till next week because we just want to get to the meat of the matter this week. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, Chip, before we get to the interview and here, you had a chance to listen to it. Any thoughts? It was awesome, man. It was a really good interview. You guys did a great job. I really enjoyed listening to him. And I was chuckling to myself at how many of his answers uh, sounded very similar to the, to the answers that I would have given. <laughs> you know, he and I have slightly different backgrounds, but a lot of overlap in some of the things we've done. So it was really cool to hear him talk about the F-35 and the evolution to get to that. So I'm hoping to add to that a little bit. But it, it was, dude, it was awesome, man. I think your listeners are going to love it. No doubt. Well, the listeners have waited this long. Let's get to the interview on the Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II. Well, this being the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we have been a bit remiss, frankly, in not covering the latest, greatest, arguably the most expensive fighter developed yet. And that ends today. Thanks to Lieutenant Colonel Tucker Hamilton, who's phoning in. He's active duty Air Force and a former F-35 Lightning II pilot. Cinco, how's it going, buddy? I'm doing well, Jello. Thanks for having me on, man. Oh, you're welcome. It's good to have you on the show, and I'm looking forward to hearing about your experiences in the Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II. We'll just call it the F-35 going forward. But first, let's get to know you. Where are you from? Where'd you go to school? What have you done in the military so far? Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up as a young kid, kind of a few different places, but settled in Evergreen, Colorado, which is up in the foothills uh, west of Denver. Nice. Yeah, just mm -hmm. gorgeous. Uh, upbringing there. And then I went to the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado, did Air Force ROTC. 
and had an, a great time there. Uh, always welcoming in the the poor academy cadets on the the weekends. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was great there. I, you know, met my wife. She was also an ROTC, my boss at the time, which was highly frowned upon. But uh, hey, it's been over seventeen years of wedded bliss, and <laughs> yeah, we uh, we met there and. I actually kind of joined ROTC on a whim. I never planned on joining the military, but I tried it out and I loved it. I never planned on being a pilot. I never had a pilot slot. I I didn't have the eyes for it. And then right before graduating, they told me there was a waiver for my depth perception problem. And they got me a waiver and they asked me right before graduating uh, if I wanted a pilot slot that they just got for me. And I didn't really know what else I wanted to do in the Air Force. So I said yes, and I gave it a try. And I started my career down at Herbert Field as a casual lieutenant, which is in the panhandle of Florida. And casual lieutenant was me, like, basically helping out a squadron. And it just so happened it was a gunship squadron. So at AC-130, which was awesome. And it was right at the beginning of Operation Anaconda. Mm -hmm. So I just was around these warriors all the time, which was really rewarding. I learned to fly in a Cessna. And then I went off to Navy pilot training. Hmm. So interesting experience. I really enjoyed Navy pilot training. So I was down in Pensacola, Florida, and then up at Whiting Field, which is just north of Pensacola. I was in VX3, the Red Knights. And uh, I actually nearly quit pilot training multiple times. Once again, this is a kid that actually did not have a dream of flying. I found it's kind of boring which is uh, crazy for me to think back because I just love it now. But I found it boring. My wife convinced me to stick with it. (laughs) And she was right. As soon as I got to my fighter aircraft, which was uh, initially the F-15C, so single-seat air-to-air fighter, I loved it. I I loved the people. I loved the mission. And the bonus was doing amazing things in the F-15C. It was a start of an awesome, a very blessed career in my F-15C community. And then I got the call that no one wants to get, which was I was going to go be an air liaison officer, which meant they were pulling me out of the cockpit after my first assignment, which was a a huge blow to my ego and my career plans because I wanted to be a test pilot. And the one thing I needed to do was to keep flying. I needed to fly something, anything. Instead, they sent me off to Germany and it was an Air Force unit, but embedded on an army post in Mannheim, Germany. And our job was to help support the ground forces while they interfaced with the airframes. So we are the guys on the ground helping call in airstrikes. Yes. It was really cool experience because I got to meet a lot of really neat people and my aperture of what the military was all about expanded quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, I really wanted to be a test pilot still and my group commander at the time, so like a colonel, he knew it and he knew what I needed to do was fly And he heard of this program called the MC-12, which was an intelligence surveillance reconnaissance aircraft. It hadn't even flown yet, but he knew about it. And he asked if I wanted to be the initial cadre on that platform. So I heartily agreed. It got me back into the cockpit, actually on a TDY kind of basis. So I went to Afghanistan and stood up MC-12s in combat, which was a remarkable experience. It was me and like 10 other folks basically figuring out how we were going to use this platform because the unique thing about the platform is it was tactical manned ISR. So we were kind of the first ones that Big Blue Air Force was using to be the eyes and the ears of the ground operators. And it was such a rewarding experience. Hmm. And that really opened up a door for test pilot school. So I had my F-15C background, I had this MC-12 background, and then I got accepted into test pilot school. Did that for a year at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, Ended up testing afterwards, back down at Eglin Air Force Base, F-15Cs and F-15Es. Then worked on some programmatics acquisition side of uh, F-35 in DC. So I worked at the F-35 Joint Program Office for a few years. And then uh, got selected to be the Director of Operations of F-35 Flight Test out at Edwards Air Force Base which was kind of like the number two in charge of the squadron. Okay. And from there, I fleeted up as the commander of F-35 um, development out at Edwards. And our job was to develop the 
mission systems capability of the F-35A, F-35B, and F-35C. So we got to fly all three variants, or just a handful of us. Cool. And it was really neat. And on top of that mission system, which mission systems think like the interaction of the operator with the platform and the sensors in order to prosecute the attack on the battlefield, we were also responsible for flight sciences on the F-35A, which is the interaction of the airframe with the atmosphere. So think, wow. you know, can it go the speed that it's supposed to go? Can it load these certain weapons up and go pull 9Gs in the F-35A variant or 7.5Gs in F-35C or 7Gs in the F-35B? But we were just focused on the F-35A flight science testing. So we did kind of both of those things. And mm-hmm. it was an amazing team, about 1,000 people, which were uh, government civilians, military, and industry, Lockheed Martin primarily, but we also had international folks there and it was a joint unit. So we had both Navy and Marine folks embedded in the integrated test force is what we were called. Cool. And it's just an amazing experience. And from there, I moved out to MIT, which I'm currently a Air Force fellow for the MIT Security Studies Program. All right. And that's kind of, yeah, that's my background, man. Holy smokes. So, all right, I got to start at the beginning. I foresee, Cinco, a lot of emails to me that I'm going to have to forward to you about how on earth did you make it through with a vision challenge? Because I get a lot of emails from folks that want to do what we do and have different issues. So we might have to bounce back and uh, follow up with you on that one. And then when you say a casual lieutenant, I don't know if you're familiar, is that the same terminology for us as we'd say like a stash ensign? In other words, you were just kind of hanging out waiting to start and they wanted you to do something to earn your paycheck, of course. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And then I think, I don't mean to call out an error, but just for the sake of accuracy for the listener, I think you said VX3, and of course you meant VT3, oh, yes, yes. the training squadron in Whiting. Yeah. But like I said, I don't mean to pick on you, just want to be accurate. <laughs> yeah. And then your background reminds me a lot of our guest Skosh about a year ago now, who came on the show and talked about fourth versus fifth generation. Did you know him? And did you get a chance to listen to that episode? I did. Yeah, I listened to the episode. It was great. Um, clearly, I'm, I'm better than he is at, at most things, which is uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, Scotia and I go way back. Oh, cool. We tested F-15s together at Eglin. There's some interesting stories where we were flying in formation once, and I, I won't get into all the details, but I rejoined on him, and he was missing a tail. <laughs> and so I was like, hey, man, oh, I don't want to freak you out right now. I was doing a battle damage check at the end of our mission. I was like, but you're missing your tail. Uh-huh. And so I chased him around, and we landed. he landed safely, and then I pitched out to land. And then when we landed, my landing gear collapsed and we had this a major emergency where we had to come back around and Scotia really uh, saved my hide, helped me uh, read checklist and prepare for another landing where we had to come in and kind of land in a very short landing zone and we safely mm-hmm. recovered. But yeah, Scotia and I, uh, we go back. That's awesome. And it reminds me of something you said in your background, which is it's the people that really make the difference. And you have these amazing experiences and relationships. And it sounds like that's the case, at least with him. So awesome. Well, thanks for the background. And let's focus. Now, you could obviously talk about a lot of different aircraft, but let's focus today again, as we said, on the F-35. Give us a little background on this aircraft. How did it come to be for starters and what is it designed to do? Sure. The F-35 really was born with this idea on the heels of the F-22. So they wanted an aircraft that was beyond the F-22, which at the time the F-22 was only air to air. So they wanted a fifth gen multi-role fighter aircraft to be able to pick up a lot of the different roles of the other fighters that were getting older and older. Mm -hmm. So when I say fifth gen, think um, like stealth capability. Right. And multi-role, now the F-22 did just air to air at the beginning. And now it does a little bit air to ground, but it only kind of did that one mission set. And the multi-role aspect was the F-35 now being able to bring that stealth capability to all the air to air and the air to ground mission sets, which was, you know, unlike any other platform before it. At the same time, they wanted to try to standardize a, a aircraft across the services. And oh, by the way, make sure that our international partners could be a part of that because you and I have both flown with other services and it is tough Mm -hmm. because it's not standardized and the platforms don't talk as easily. You and I have both flown with international partners, I'm guessing. Yes. It's difficult because the jets don't always work well together because they weren't designed that way. And so from the beginning, the F-35 was intended to be that catch-all to be able to be the great communicator. 
So do you think, I mean, just we're going to go off script a lot here today, Cinco, so bear with me. I mean, they obviously tried to do a lot with this one aircraft. Do you think that was the right approach? I mean, is there a point where you try to do too much with one tool and, you know, a hammer can only do certain things and a wrench can only do certain things? Do you think they overextended themselves on the F-35 or did they strike a good balance with everything they wanted it to do? It's hard to say, you know, people ask me, if it was worth it. And I will tell you right now, we need the F-35. So it was worth it. But as we look back and try to say, how could we have done this better? I definitely think that there was probably some overextension. Let's just take close air support, for instance. The F-35 can do close air support. It's never going to be nowhere near as effective as an A-10. Right. And it's probably not as effective as a Strike Eagle per se, because you know you have a single seat fighter aircraft and the strike eagle has two and and that weapons system officer the combat system officer in the back seat brings a lot to the fight so you know it can do the missions that it's supposed to but it definitely suffers from being a real expert and being able to deep dive in each one of them because of the trade-offs that were made in order to allow it to be multi gotcha and then obviously you know, they have, well, as we'll get to in a moment, we have variants that do so many different things. And so there are trade-offs, right? So if you wanted a pure vertical replacement for the Harrier, they might have developed different things. And of course the right. navalized variant, we would have probably enjoyed a second engine. Done. Yes. But, uh, yeah. Okay. So we'll get to all that. So at any rate, they have all these various requirements and there's a fly-off, as I recall, between the Boeing X-32 and the Lockheed Martin X-35. And I think we all know what the answer was, but did you know much about the Boeing contender? No, I didn't. I mean, I've seen the special that was run, you know, at the time, mm -hmm. kind of talking about the fly-off that was going on. I know that there were probably going to be some major concerns of how that platform, the Boeing platform, was going to be able to be as stealthy, but I, I'm not an expert by any means. Okay. Yeah. On a side note with your test background, maybe you can speak to this. I've always heard that a lot of times these initial X aircraft, if you will, are really just kind of hobbled together almost like Frankenstein from spare parts on different things, just almost like a technology demonstrator. And the idea being that Boeing or Lockheed Martin can say, hey, look, here's something that roughly flies and meets what you asked us to do. And then, of course, given the contract and enough time, we can actually build it from scratch to really do all these things well. I mean, is there some truth to that? I thought I remember hearing, for example, that I forget what X plane it was, but it was using like landing gear out of an A6 intruder or an A7 Corsair or something like that. Oh yeah. I mean, when they're developing those X planes, especially for a fly off, it is not the final product by any stretch. It, no. it really is a prototype, a demonstration of what could possibly be. But, you know, there are some things that if you take a look at the X 32 compared to what now is the F-35. In general, I think they stick with that. They don't just completely change what it's going to look like. And right. if you look at the X-32, there are aspects of that, aerodynamically speaking, that I think would make it not as effective as what is now the F-35. Mm -hmm. And then just again, kind of off script, and if you don't want to answer, that's fine. When the process is happening and the selection is being made, is it truly this is the better aircraft or is there an element of, well, if we don't give them a contract, they're going to go out of business and we need to keep more companies viable? How pure is the process, I guess, if you don't mind me asking? Well, I don't know. And I'm not an expert regarding that, but okay. I, you know, I'll give you my opinion. And I think as a citizen of America, it's important that we have a strong industrial complex Mm -hmm. you know, and different companies that can provide different things to the fight. And I think it is important to be able to have these large corporations involved in certain in ways. So I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing if it's all equal, right? And you're bringing mm -hmm. the, the same capability to the warfighter. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing to be able to rely on different companies to support sure. um, development. And there's different ways different companies will approach a problem. And so, yes, there's goodness all around, if you will. We'd have major issue with that if the capability was starkly different. Sure. Right. right. This is assuming that the what they're bringing to the fight is pretty much the mm -hmm. same thing. 
Well, just based on looks, with all due respect to our friends at Boeing, I think the F-35 does look a bit better than (laughs) the X-32, but it's not just about looks, although as fighter pilots, I think we have to, of course, be mindful of that. So, all right, the background all led to a, as you said, single seat, single engine, all weather, stealth, fifth generation, multi-role combat aircraft designed for ground attack and air superiority. And so what we ended up with is the F-35 and of all the different things it can do, and as uh, I think we talked about before we started rolling tape, your experience in the F-35 is somewhat limited to tests. So you, you didn't do a deployment or you were not in an operational squadron, is that correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. But from what you know, having continued to watch the program, is there any particular task or mission it does well? Or is there a certain niche it's found itself in, in employment? The main thing... And it's not necessarily a mission set, but it absorbs and more importantly disseminates information like no platform in the history of aviation. Okay. So that is kind of the game changer. Unlike the F-22, which absorbs a lot of information, it has a harder time disseminating on that side. Mm -hmm. The F-35 absorbs even more. And when I say absorbs, I mean, it is taking the electromagnetic spectrum and absorbing a lot of information about what is going on around it. Mm -hmm. And then it has a unique capability to communicate certain things about that electromagnetic spectrum to other players in the field. So that could be other F-35s, or it could be an AWACS, or it could be a boat, or it could be other people that are connected in with, you know, and have the ability to connect into the data link, if you will. So it is a really big game changer with regard to just information dissemination. And on top of that, you know, being able to do the 12 mission sets. I, I think the bread and butter of the F-35 that other platforms can't do in a stealth manner is to be able to know where a target area is, go use their radar to kind of map that ground from really far away, on that map, find the targets, and this could be suppression of enemy air defense, so surface-to-air missile capability, Mm -hmm. where you're finding surface-to-air missile threats, and then going in in stealth capability and dropping weapons and egressing safely, and doing all of that with embedded sensors. So there's nothing external to the platform that is uh, keeping it from being able to do its 12 mission sets. Gotcha. Yeah, I was going to say, as we record this, I have an F-15 Eagle episode interview recorded, but I haven't played it yet. And so I don't know what order things will come out. But our guest for that talked about some of the employment at Red Flag. And of course, we have to be careful. But to your point, yes, kind of breaking down the door, taking out double digit SAMs, doing things that are uniquely capable to it, a lot like the F 117 did in its time, although not against uh, in a seed role, as you said. Sure. I think also to your point, You have the ability to do all these missions in, let's call it stealth mode, and then you could turn around and load external stations with weapons. And as you said earlier, do CAS, you can do whatever else, depending on the threat and the situation. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk variants. And of course we have the X variant and we don't need to drop anchor there, but let's just start with F-35A and just tell us if you would, what each variant is and how it's different maybe than the next one or... And who's using it, if you're aware? Yeah, yeah, of course. So the F-35A is the Air Force variant. It's not just the Air Force, of course, because it's the most widely disseminated variant that is being purchased by our international partners. Okay. And the F-35A is a traditional aircraft that you think of when you think about an aircraft landing on a runway. So it has... uh, ability and only ability to land on a piece of runway in front of a a pilot. So the F-35A also has a certain fuel load, and the fuel is probably one of the biggest things that a pilot notices between the different variants. Okay. So I'll get into now the F-35B. So the F-35B is a Stovall variant, which stands for short takeoff and vertical landing. So short takeoff, it could technically do a vertical takeoff. But to be able to do a vertical takeoff, it would need to be super low on fuel because fuel weighs a lot. Sure. And to be able to do a vertical takeoff, you need to be able to counter that thrust pushing down to go vertical would need to counter the weight of the fuel, which you would not be able to do with full fuel. So what you do is you have a short takeoff capability where the back nozzle swings down a little bit. And then there is 
a lift door that opens up right behind where the pilot sits and it produces lift right there. There's a lift engine. And then you're able to, at much slower speeds, lift off and much shorter distances, lift off with a full fuel load and go do your mission. The F-35B was purchased by the Marine Corps. And then you have the F-35C, which is the aircraft carrier variant. We call it the CV carrier variant. Mm -hmm. And that was purchased by the US Navy and some of our international partners as well. And the carrier variant is what you think about with a catapult off an aircraft carrier and then a trap to land on an aircraft carrier where there's a hook that catches a cable. You know, think of Top Gun, if you will. Right. Now, I want to real quick go back. The F-35B was also purchased by our UK partners. So they are flying the F-35B as well. And those are the three variants. Mm -hmm. The differences in the cockpit are none. You, you can't tell as a pilot which variant you're flying with regard to what is being displayed to you, which is great. The differences are primarily in fuel. So the F-35C has the most fuel. F-35A is next and F-35B. Because of all that lift fan and all the extra stuff with the engine that is very complicated, kind of a masterpiece really by um, Pratt & Whitney mm -hmm. and uh, Rolls-Royce, yeah. Because of that, it's so heavy, then you have to trade off that extra weight for the fuel. So it has the least amount of fuel. Oh, wow. Yeah, the F-35C has an eight-foot longer wingspan than the A and the B. You can tell the F-35C's wingtips fold up so they can be stored on a ship. But the wings are bigger on the F-35C. Both tails are bigger on the F-35C. And the landing gear is much more robust. And that is all a factor of it being able to land on an aircraft carrier. To do so, you want an aircraft that can approach the carrier at a lower speed. Mm -hmm. So you have bigger wings, bigger tails to be able to do that so it can land at a lower, uh, slower speed. Right. And more fuel because the runway is not always available to you like it is if you have 12,000 feet at an airfield. So yeah. a little more loiter time to land in cycles, as we call it. All right, so let's go back to the beginning. So an F-35A, as you stated, is like a F-15 or 16 where you need a conventional long runway. Now, just to be clear, it still has a hook, just like a F-15 or a 16, but it's just for an emergency, essentially. It's not for landing on a carrier. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and then this is the only aircraft with a built-in cannon. Yeah, the F-35A has an internal gun that fires 181 rounds of 25 millimeter and 25 millimeter, probably designed for increased effectiveness against ground targets. I mean, you can yeah. use it for air to air as well, but okay. And then the B variant to your point. So it needs a little bit of a run, but so does the Harrier, according to our guest who came on the show and talked about that. So if we put some F-35Bs on marine amphibious ships, then they have a little bit of a deck run. And like you said, you, then you can load it up with the fuel and the weapons you need, but with the wind down the deck and a little short deck run, then you, off you go. And ideally, by the time you come back, you're light enough to do a vertical landing. Exactly. Yeah. So let me ask you this. If I see all three of these aircraft either parked on the ramp next to each other or flying in formation? How do I tell them apart? Well, the F-35C is a little bit easier because of the wings and the tails being bigger. Okay. And you can look at the landing gear. The landing gear on the F-35C, the nose gear, has actually two wheels. And that's probably for the launch bar, I'm guessing. Exactly. Okay. The other variants just have one wheel. So that's a quick way to tell that it's an F-35C. Okay. F-35B, as a kind of eyebrows or ears right behind the cockpit. Okay. And that's where the lift door is. Yes. Of course, so the lift door is open, very obvious, a huge barn door behind the pilot, but typically it's not. And so you would notice a little hump okay. kind of right behind where the pilot sits with an F-35B. And then the F-35A is just a little bit sleeker right. and it doesn't have okay. that aspect of it. So that's kind of how you would tell a difference. Um, Are they all painted the, the same or, or is one of them a little darker? No? And not that I know of. No. We, I mean, for us, all the ones we flew were all painted the same. Okay. And then to your point about in the cockpit, wouldn't the F-35B be a little different because of your necessity to have controls to hover? Or is that built straight into the stick and throttle? Yeah. So the difference in the cockpit is a few of the displays that you can pull up in front of you. Okay are different based on the variants. So for instance, like the flight control page for the F-35B has ability for you to go into Stovall mode. The 
flight control page for the F-35C has an ability to fold the wings. Gotcha. Right. And so there's just some buttons on a few different pages that indicate that it is, no kidding, a different variant. But when you're prosecuting the attack and you're flying it on the battlefield, there's no difference in either the throttle stick or the displays in front of you. Okay. Now, there was a lot of compromises that were made to make the F-35 the way it is. And a lot of them really stemmed from the F-35B variant. Mm -hmm. And that requirement to have the lift fan right there and to land on the LHD uh, aircraft carriers, which is a landing helicopter deck. Mm -hmm. I think there's like eight or so LHDs and they're super expensive. So it was more important to make sure there was an airplane that could land on that than changing the ships themselves. Because of that, you have the single engine aspect of it. You have a canopy that opens the like the wrong <laughs> uh-huh. way. That's what I think in my mind. Like you see typical canopies open a certain way where, you know, the front of the canopy opens all the way up and the back is still attached is hinged in the back, but it's the opposite in the F-35 for all the variants because the F-35B has all that gear right behind the pilot. So it, the canopy needed to open up, uh-huh. you know, the other way. Yeah. So those are just some examples of the compromises that were made. Well, I also heard, I don't know if it's true or if you've heard this, but they said, look, there's no possible way to make the C variant a two engine aircraft. So we're just going to accept that we may lose a couple and that's still cheaper than building a second variant that has two engines. Is that, well, you ever I, hear anything like not that? Not that story necessarily, but I will say that the reliability of the engines is really remarkable. Mm-hmm. Like Pratt and Whitney has done a very good job and it was a long road. So I have a lot of respect for companies that have, you know, worked and made the F-35 the way it is, it didn't happen overnight. And I would say right now though, the engine is extremely reliable. So I do think that they're Mm going to be able to deliver on that. Only time will tell, of course. Sure. I'm very impressed because I'm a two engine kind of guy and I was very wary about going into a single engine fighter and they really impressed me with how reliable their engine uh, has been. Yeah. Well, and they've had single engine aircraft at the carrier before, the A4, A7, among others. So it's not the end of the world. Okay. And then as far as other operators go, like you said, uh, Australia, Belgium, Denmark, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, South Korea, the UK, as you said. And I think, by the way, you said the F-35C was for the Navy. I believe the Marine Corps has got a couple C variants as well. No, that's true. The Navy bought the Cs. Okay. And then is there an F-35I? Did I read that correctly? The F-35I is an F-35A that Israel bought. Okay. They indicate theirs with an I at the end, but it is an F-35A variant. Okay. And some of those countries are partners, and some of them are foreign military sales like countries. Yeah. So some of them have bought the F-35, like Israel, for instance, mm-hmm. and they're using the F-35. But some of them, like the United Kingdom, they actually develop their partners with the development right. of the F-35. So there's a little bit of a difference between some of those countries that you rattled off. Gotcha. And speaking of that, going off script again a little bit, was part of that, if you're willing to wager, an effort to make sure that the program succeeded? In other words, I once heard that parts of the F-35 were built in 48 out of 50 states in the U.S. so that no congressman would ever want to cancel it because it would affect jobs in his state. And then, of course, you have all these international partners. I mean, is there anything to all that or was is that just coincidence or do you know? I don't know. I mean, I've heard that same thing before. Mm-hmm. I do know that if they planned it or not, that definitely did not hurt because the F-35 has had a lot of problems. <laughs> uh-huh. And I can only imagine that regardless if it was planned or not, which I have no idea, yeah. that it has definitely helped the longevity or the ability for the F-35 to get through kind of the rough times sure. that it had. But it's frustrating when I look back, especially as a test pilot, every platform we've ever flown has had rough times. Like, of course. You know, nothing was developed overnight or was effective as we thought or wanted it to be right away. So yeah. I think timeline-wise, the F-35 was delivered and has been very capable in just the same amount of time that all those other platforms took to be, you know, capable. How many, if you're willing to say, of those quote-unquote problems were engineering problems versus micromanagement? In other words, sometimes budgets get cut or, or held short for a while if you're Think back to sequestration in 2013 and some of the lingering effects that arguably we still feel. I mean, if given proper resourcing and no meddling by others, would these problems have been as big? Or was a lot of it just that that we were trying to do something amazing with the technology? I think most of it was the latter. Most of it really was we were on the leading edge of so much of this. I mean, 
the military had these requirements that no one had ever been able to deliver before. And it just takes time to create that capability. So I think that was definitely a piece of it. Mm -hmm. You got to look back though and know that there were probably missteps with regard to program management and acquisition, like the way that we acquired it and, and some issues with concurrency, for instance, which concurrency is when you are testing the F-35 development testing it and operationally testing it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so you're basically creating a lot of F-35s while you still are developing it, which could cause problems because if you find something in development, now you have to go retrofit all these other aircraft that are doing other things that aren't testing. Uh. So concurrency is a challenge. Not saying it was a bad thing here, but there was some definitely some programmatic issues. I think for a few years, like Lockheed Martin was actually in charge, like legitimately in charge of flight testing. And that wasn't going that well. It wasn't necessarily anything against Lockheed Martin, but it was kind of a new model of how we are going to conduct flight testing. And then the government took that back under their wing, I think in like 2011 timeframe, summer 2012, something like that. Mm -hmm. And they were able to be more effective with regard to some of the program management things. So there were some things on the former, but I really think that it was almost all the latter gotcha. and the challenges of just developing this uh, really cool technology. Yeah. Before we leave variants, what was it like for you with your background in Eagles and then the MC-12 to fly the B model? Did it come naturally or did it take a little time? Lockheed Martin did a really phenomenal job of making an intuitive flight control system for the F-35B and making that whole engine system work in a very seamless fashion that you pretty much could train any pilot in a fairly short amount of time to effectively land that aircraft, one, hover it, and then land it on an aircraft carrier. Wow. It is really remarkable. The thing's solid like a rock. And it's intuitive in the sense that you, as a pilot, aren't doing much to keep it under control. It is doing almost all of it by itself with the computers. And you're just providing some inputs that totally makes sense to you. It's like playing a video game almost. Mm -hmm. You want to move a little to the left. You just bank a little bit to the left and then you can roll out. And it is so solid that it, it gets you kind of right where you need to be. So they did a great job with that. And it's autonomous for the most part. If I want to slow down, I set certain speeds. It does all that for me. Very different from what I understand compared to the Harrier. Mm -hmm. And I've never flown the Harrier, but I have many friends that have. And I mean, totally different experience. So yeah, they did a really good job with the uh, that part of the F-35B. And honestly, it is also a part of the F-35C where that aircraft, from my understanding, I've never landed on an aircraft carrier, but it's so intuitive and easy and nearly, not fully, but nearly autonomous with regard to landing on the carrier. So they did a really good job with that. Cool. Yeah. Our guest Magua, who did the AV-8 Harrier episode for the show, had a little chance to fly the F-35B at the end. And Based on his thousands of hours of experience in the Harrier, I think he said it was a little counterintuitive to him, but by then he already had muscle memory built, you know, for flying oh, the Harrier. Yeah. I think if I remember correctly, he intimated what you just did, which is for someone who's never had the experience to hop in, it would come very quickly to them. But for him, it was a little counterintuitive. So sure. anyway, well, let's move on to why it looks the way it looks. And part of this is based at the beginning, like we said, that they designed it with, there are only single seat variants, for example, right? So and there is only going to be a single engine variant. But when you look at it, how would you describe how it looks and why it looks the way it does? When I look at it, I think of it as any other fighter aircraft, just sleeker for the most part. I like to look at the wings and to see how the way they're producing the F-35 is really neat, just with composites. And it allows it so that the aspects of the wing that make it very aerodynamically efficient are just really built into it compared to, you know, you look at the F-15, for instance, and mm -hmm. they're kind of straight edges and you can kind of see where they would put certain things together to make it all work. And the F-35 looks like it's kind of molded from just one piece of material. So it looks really sleek. It does look stealthy. If you were to look at it, you'd also notice that there's really no sensors or antennas mm -hmm. like popping out, which is aspect 
of its ability to be stealthy. They also didn't want it too large because just the larger you get, the bigger radar cross section you need to really worry about, especially with fifth gen and the kind of the purpose of the F-35 to keep it as stealthy as possible. So it's bigger than an F-16, but it looks kind of like a small aircraft until you get close up. It just looks, um, you know, like other fighters. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that. You know how it looks. It <laughs> no, it's I don't know, it looks like yeah. a fighter to me. <laughs> I guess it's like trying to describe what your kid looks like. It's like, well, you know, like a normal kid. But yeah. okay, let's move on to armament. We've already talked about the gun. Uh, let's start with air to air. What do the variants carry, and do all variants carry the same things? No, except for the gun, of course. The variants actually carry different things, and some of that is a factor of the weapon bay. So the F-35B has a little bit smaller weapon bay, so it does not carry 2,000-pound bombs, for instance. But let me go through kind of the different armament for the different variants. So for the F-35A, B, and C, your air-to-air weapons are the AMRAAM and the AIM-9X. So the AMRAAM, which is Advanced Medium Range Air-to-Air Missile, is a typical Mm -hmm. AIM-120 that fighter aircraft, both in the Navy and Marines and the Air Force all fly. And that can be stored internally in the F-35. Externally, the three variants can use the AIM-9X, which is a heat-seeking missile known as a sidewinder, mm-hmm. a really phenomenal piece of equipment that Raytheon has you know, produced there. And that can only be carried externally. Oh. Yeah. And then you have the internal gun for the F-35A, and then you have a gun pod for the F-35B and F-35C. So the gun pod actually fits right underneath the aircraft, kind of at the intersection of where the two doors, there's two weapon bays, Uh where the doors meet in the center line. Okay. So that's the like air to air capability. Now the air to ground capabilities where you get a little bit different. So the F-35A has GBU 31s, which is a JDAM, a joint direct attack munition, 2000 pound GBU 31. GBU 12 can also be carried both internally and externally. Oh, by the way, that JDAM can be carried internally only. Gotcha. The GBU 12 is carried both internally or externally and is a 500 pound laser guided bomb. And then internally, the F-35A can also carry SDB-1, which is small diameter bomb one. SDB-2 will be coming, but right now SDB-1 is uh, what can be carried on the F-35A. Okay. There is a hard point under each weapon bay that can carry air to ground munitions. And then there are three hard points on each wing that you could put external weapons on with the outboard hard point only being used for the AIM-9X. Okay. So the two inboard on each wing can carry the actual air to ground munitions. The F-35B internally can carry the GBU-32, which is a JDAM that's 1,000 pounds. And then it it can also carry the GBU-12, which are the 500-pound laser-guided bombs, both internal Mm -hmm. and external. The F-35C can carry the GBU-31 JDAM, 2,000 pound. It can also carry the GBU-32, which is a 1,000 pound JDAM. And it can carry the GBU-12, 500 pound, both internal and external. And then it it also can carry the JSAO. I can't remember what the JSAO, you probably know. What's the JSAO stand for? Joint standoff weapon. Okay. So the F-35C can carry that as well internally. Okay. And then the UK had requirements. So I've flown and tested the UK requirements, which was a Paveway 4. And the ASRAM. So ASRAM is an air-to-air weapon. And then the Paveway 4 is a like a 500-pound air-to-ground weapon. Gotcha. ASRAM, I think, is the AIM-132, as I understand. Yeah, that's right. And okay. they also can... It was kind of a last-minute change, but we also got capability to fly the GBU-49, which is a Paveway 4, like the Paveway 4, which is a British weapon. And I just mentioned oh. Paveway 4, but it's a GBU-49 for us, and we have that capability to fly with that. Yeah, I've not heard of the Paveway 4. I've definitely heard of the 3. And I'm guessing none of these carry the Paveway 3, right? That's like a 2,400-pound bunker buster. (laughs) Exactly. The GBU-12 is a Paveway 2. Yeah, nothing Paveway 3, but we do have a Paveway 4 cape. So for the gun pod, is it still 25 millimeters? And is it still about the same 180-ish rounds? Yeah, the gun pod is 25 millimeters, but 230 rounds. Okay. So on the AIM-9X, our guest Stretch on the F-22 episode said that they hold theirs internally, and then when they go to employ it, the doors pop open, it pops out, looks at the target, and off it goes. Not the case on the F-35, I guess. 
just held externally, which makes it easy to deal with because it can be searching for the target before you fire it off, unlike the F-22. But it's also hanging out there, which means the pylon and the missile are increasing your radar cross signature. Right. So you're going into combat the first night of a war in stealth mode, Mm -hmm. which means nothing is on your wings. And now you have AMRAMs and air-to-ground bombs in your weapon bays. Gotcha. And then once you don't have to worry about the surface air missile threats, then you start hanging things, which includes the AIM-9X. Okay. So what could be a typical load on night one, let's say? I would think that you're going to bring in AMRAMs and then you're going to have the JDAMs. Yeah, like how many of each, if you're able to say? You're probably loading up one JDAM in each weapon bay. Okay. And then the, the AMRAMs. So you can fight your way in, fight your way out. Everything is internal. Now, if you are flying overseas, is it safe to assume you can hang some external tanks on the wing stations? That's a good point. Initially, that wasn't the plan, but I think they are working to be able to do that, but it's not yet. So it is a desirement in the future to be able to have external tanks to be able to transition aircraft from one AOR to another. Mm -hmm. But I do not think that they plan on going into combat with tanks on. Okay. Like in the F-15, we would go into combat with tanks on, and if we were met with a threat, we would jettison our tanks and we'd go fight and we'd get out of there. Sure. I don't think that is the intent with these tanks that they're looking to put on the F-35, but that's just something that they're looking to do. What about the Navy variant? I have to think they're going to want to hang tanks, aren't they? That's a good question. The F-35, and I don't know if you want to get into it now, at some point, talk about it. It basically is changing what it means to be a fighter pilot. And that influences a lot of different things, which includes the Navy's approach to using the F-35 with regard to how much fuel it needs to come back and land. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know if you want me to you know, talk about that now or later, but I truly believe it's a game changer for what it means to be a fighter pilot. And what our training is all about is going to change dramatically because yeah. the F-35C, for instance, is so good at landing on the boat and so intuitive and just simpler than anything in the past, that you have less training requirement and you have less fuel needed to come back to get on the boat because it's going to do almost all of it on its own the first time, right? Yeah. But it'll be interesting to see how much of that, I don't mean to say I think you're wrong, but it'll be interesting to see how much of that actually parlays into the ability to come back with less fuel because all it takes is some young airmen and there's plenty of them on the flight deck of the carrier to wander into the landing area and the F-35 gets waved off. And so it doesn't land for the first try, not because of any systems issue or anything else, but just because of human error of some 18 year old. So I bet they'll slowly work their way to it, but certainly a functional and very proficient air wing, I think could uh, definitely do that. But Yeah, I I bet that will change things. So, well, let's just finish uh, armament real quick. How about defensive systems? I assume it's got expendables, right? Yeah, yeah. You're able to carry chaff and flare. Okay. And you are also able to use a distributed aperture system. So the distributed aperture system, or what we call DAS, is a set of six cameras that are placed around the F-35 external. So they're looking out. And what they're doing is they're weaving together a video of the world around them. And they're taking that video and they're able to play it in the pilot's helmet, which is actually quite a neat capability. It's IR based. So we typically use it at night and it kind of turns night into day. And it's much better than uh, the NVG capability or night vision camera, really. There's, we don't wear goggles in the F-35. We have a night vision camera. Okay. But this DAS system is pretty much what we use instead of the night vision camera, just because it's more effective. But, um, it was really created as a missile defense capability. So if I get launched at from the ground from a surface air missile, like directly underneath me, I can look down if I have this video up and I look through the aircraft. So that's what this DAS does. It gives you kind of full 360 degree awareness of the surroundings without the actual cockpit, you know, getting in the way of looking at that. Mm -hmm. So it was created for missile defense. So that's one thing that gets your eyes onto any kind of incoming threat. And then you do have that chaff and flare capability. All right, Cinco. Well, that's as good as a a transition as any into the helmet itself. So this is not the joint helmet mounted queuing system that you might've had in your F-15. This is an entirely new helmet. And as I understand, a fairly expensive one, is that correct? (laughs) Yeah. The helmet, they run over $400,000 a piece. And wow. yeah, I had two as a test pilot. So you can imagine the wow. very expensive equipment that we carried around and 
hopefully didn't drop. Yeah. Very neat capability. It's light, it's balanced, and it is very reliable, which really surprised me. So I flew around uh, traditional helmets for you know years, and then mm -hmm. the joint helmet mounting queuing system, which is a Jehemix for years as well. I found the Jehemix was heavy. It wasn't balanced well on my head, so it really put a lot of strain on my neck. So if I wore that for a few hours on a mission, I would seriously start to feel it in my mm. neck. And then when you pull G's with the Jehemix, you could feel it. Like it would kind of pull your head down a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I just don't feel that with the helmet that we have in the F-35. So it's well balanced and it is light. And it has a capability, like I mentioned a second ago, to kind of pipe in video and other things into your helmet, right. primarily augmented reality of the world around you. And there's a lot of things that you can select with it. It is a binocular system. But it's interesting. There's some things that are shown to both eyes and some things that are just shown to one eye. So your eyes have to be lined <laughs> up well. And there is like, for instance, there is one mission where I went out and um, I needed to look at my helmet display for this mission, very specific G-forces that I needed to pull at certain altitudes and airspeeds and all this. And I came back in with, after a four hour mission with a splitting headache and I talked to the life support troop and he was like, oh man, sorry, I gave you someone else's helmet. And I never realized it, but my eyes for about three days were like kind of flipped out and it was giving me headaches because you don't realize how just specifically aligned that it needs to be for you mm -hmm. individually. Yeah, it's a great capability in the sense that it, I never really had reliability problems with my helmet. It always seemed to work. And then you don't have a HUD, a heads-up display in the F-35, oh. which I never trusted before I started flying it. <laughs> I was like, there's no way it's going to be as reliable. You know, there's going to be problems because my Jehemix always had problems. And then I would rely on my HUD for, you know, flight data. But this helmet is, like I said, reliable. And when you look out where you would traditionally see a heads-up display, you see a heads-up display, but it's all displayed in your helmet. And even uh -huh. if you turn your nugget quite quickly, you know, left, right, up, down, whatever, <laughs> yep. you are seeing like this display is kind of rock solid right there and it stays there. It's pretty impressive the way they were able to do that. I would say so. Do you know if there is any talk about retrofitting this helmet to other aircraft? Or is it specific to the Lightning? It's specific to the 35, yeah. Okay. And then while we're talking avionics, I assume everything else as far as cockpit integration, HOTAS, the ability to fly it. I mean, it's all got to be pretty transparent and flawless, I would hope, with technology these days. Is it a joy to fly or is it a little bit of work? Oh, I think it's a joy to fly. Yeah. You know, it's sleek cockpit, very few buttons. It's so different from anything I've flown before. Mm -hmm. When you usually get in, you just have so many buttons. I think even with if you count the landing gear, there's probably like 10 switches and that's it in the cockpit. <laughs> really? You know, there is just nothing about that. There's generator switches, engine on off kind of switch, mm -hmm. a few others, but that is pretty much it. It, it is wow. all right there on a touch screen right in front of you, which is also extremely reliable. Not rows and rows of circuit breakers like exactly. 50 years ago. Yeah, okay. like whole circuit breaker, row two, whatever it was. You'd have like a whole circuit breaker list in your checklist. That's so you'd right. know what to mm -hmm. pull. And no, nothing like that at all. So it, it's really simple to fly. And I think that's what is kind of step one of the F-35 being a game changer for what it means to be a fighter pilot mm -hmm. is this idea that they've taken the flying aspect of it and made it simpler. Yeah. So now you can operate the system and be more effective on the battlefield. Sure. But let's take the flip side of the coin. What's it like for the people on the ground who have to maintain this? And we've tried on the show to include more of that information, but I understand there's an automatic logistics information system and a few other ways that this aircraft can be a little easier to maintain, particularly if you compare it to something like the F-14 Tomcat or some of the older aircraft. I mean, is it easier for the folks on the ground or because of its complexity, is it harder? A quick correction, it's autonomic. Autonomic. Oh, okay. <laughs> Autonomic. Uh, I don't know where they came up with that name. Okay. So Alice, yeah, that is a tough question to answer because there are things okay. that this is way simpler for the maintainers to deal with. And there's things that it make it more difficult. And some of the difficulty just comes from the interface with technology, the computer system. You may have the part physically in your hand. You may know how to change it. You may be able to go to change it, but you can't get approval from the computer system to go change that part because of, you know, computer systems. You got, you know, <laughs> issues with them or, you know, some kind of communication problem. So it can be frustrating in that sense. 
But if you take that piece of it and, and say you were to streamline that computer system and make it with few errors, mm-hmm. I think for the most part, it really helps uh, the maintainers out because it tells them exactly what they need to do and how they need to do it. And the checklists are right there. And it seems to be very, you know, quite robust. And there are things that are easier to be able to maintain in this than in others. And of course, Mm -hmm. you know, you'll always have challenges with certain parts and I can think of a few, but I won't mention them here. Just sure. That's fine. For proprietary reasons or whatever. But the old days, not that any pilot should ever have done this, but in the old days, if you were to, let's say, pull a little more G's than you're supposed to, you could reach down and hit the little reset button and you come home fat, dumb, and happy. I'm guessing the F-35 doesn't quite let you get away with things uh, <laughs> no. in case you were so inclined. It's, it's pretty much reporting on you before you even land. Yeah. Is that correct? No, I mean, I would never do what you <laughs> said, of course. Never. <laughs> That's never happened. But yeah, it, it basically is recording everything. Mm -hmm. And it's not just recording like maintenance, but it is recording everything, which is great. It's a data mine. We in the military are trying to figure out how to mine that data more effectively, how to use machine learning and artificial intelligence and all those things to help us become more effective with all of that data. But yeah, it is especially um, keen to call you out if you do anything wrong. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, that's probably not a bad thing. So, all right. How about performance? What's the fastest you've ever had one of these? What's the highest? Yeah. So we can go up to 50 and we can go out to 700 KCAS 1.6 Mach. And I've been to all those. So as a test pilot, that's kind of where we go a lot of times as a de- sure. developmental test pilot, we're making sure that it's one safe and then two meets the contractual specifications. Mm-hmm. And those contractual specifications are always at the corner of the airspeed altitude envelopes. Okay. So, you know, think high and fast and high and low, make the right-hand side of a graph, if you will, of airspeed altitude and, and then low and slow, and then high and slow, make the other portion of that envelope that we talk about. So yeah, it's not easy to get to the end speed. And that's true for every fighter. And I've taken fighters to their end speed a few times, and it's always a challenge, but it gets to 1.6 more effective than other platforms get to their two plus mock, you know, end speeds. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good uh, with high angle of attack compared to some platforms. I kind of think of it as a kind of a strike eagle with regard to how it performs um, with angle of attack. I mean, it's nowhere near the F-15C or the Hornet, and I've flown both of those platforms. It is fairly effective at uh, high angle of attack, right around where, what a strike eagle you'd consider. Mm-hmm. And then 700 KCAS, the calibrated airspeed that we go to, is once again, it's easy to get to, and it feels rock solid getting there. It gets noisy in every aircraft when you go into those high dynamic pressure situations. So uh-huh. dynamic pressure is higher at lower altitudes. So just think of the air has more moisture, the molecules are closer together right. because it's denser so that the pressure that you're experiencing on the skin of the aircraft is higher at a lower altitude. And that's what you get when you get to 700 KCAS, you're getting to a, a high dynamic pressure. And it does well in those uh, scenarios. And the Gs, uh, once again, more like a strike eagle where you're not pulling nine Gs at you know 25,000 feet you can, and and I have, but it's very difficult to get there. You have to be going super fast to do that. Mm-hmm. But you're able to sustain nine Gs uh, at 10,000, or you know, somewhere around there. I, I don't know all the specifics, yeah. but um, yeah, it does well. Okay. Yeah, to your point, I've had an F-18 over Mach 1.6, but it was a dedicated effort. There was nothing hanging on it, no pylons. I was up at 40,000 feet plus, got it to about 1.2 in level flight, and then did a 45 degree dive and full afterburner. And Finally, when I couldn't take anymore, I think I saw about 1.65 and pulled out. But it's an effort. And some aircraft, of course, all aircraft are compromises, as we've talked about today. And so sounds like with the design, though, of the F-35, maybe it's a little easier to hit some of those numbers because it's probably a little cleaner compared yeah. to other designs, huh? Yeah, I, no, I think that's true. All right. What about just real quick dogfighting in it? You touched on it. And I remember an article some time ago, and you know, I'm cynical as I get older. And I don't believe half of what I read in the news. And I think a lot of times they just want to make sensation. But I want to say there was an article about, oh, the F-35 just lost a dogfight to an F-16. And of course, you and I both know that on any given day, if you and I are fighting, I might beat you one day and you might beat me the next day. But then if we switch airplanes, that could change things, configurations, so many other things. And then also, frankly, the F-35 isn't designed, I wouldn't think, to go, you know, knife it up in a phone booth and slug it out. It needs to do 
what it's supposed to be doing without being seen and stealth and all that other stuff. But I mean, can it hold its own if it gets into the visual arena? And what have you had a chance to do, if anything? Yeah, you know, it absolutely can. I'm sure there's going to be some listeners if they've dogfight, if they've, you know, flown the F-35 and this regime may disagree with me. But I remember that article. I was actually a part of the program office when that came out and had to do all these responses to the <laughs> the Hill and other people that were concerned about it. I knew mm-hmm. the pilot that did that. That was a test mission. It was very frustrating for me because the media in that instance, they totally got it wrong. The pilot wasn't doing a dogfighting test. He was going up there, doing something else. He had no mission systems on the aircraft. He was checking how the aircraft did with a certain like pitch rate that he was trying to find or something like that. It was maybe yaw rate or pitch rate or something that he was trying to evaluate in a very specific regime. Uh-huh. And the way that he wrote his report at the end was that he kind of set up a dogfight scenario, even though it was not a dogfight at all. And he just was trying to respond to another aircraft kind of putting their nose on and putting pressure on him so that he could kind of get a realistic feel. And then he in that test setup where he was trying to evaluate this one thing, you know, I think there was a comment that that they needed to change this thing in order for it to be effective in a dogfight, i.e. that he lost this dogfight. But it's frustrating because it was never a dogfight. Right. It wasn't a mission system F-35. It also was very early on in the development of the F-35. I think he was flying 2B software, which was way back in the day. And we're flying multiple generations of software beyond that, like 40 different iterations of software, I think the number is (laughs) beyond that. So when it comes to dogfighting, though, big picture, it can hold its own if you know how to fly it. That was also a thing. The initial cadre of the F-35 was typically F-16 pilots. And so when they were learning how to use the F-35, they were using it the way that they typically use their F-16, which was more of a rate fight kind of mentality. They didn't really know how to use the rudders yet. And when they figured out how to effectively use the platform, the way that it was designed, they realized that it can be just as an effective dogfighter as other fighters. It's heavier though, so it's always going to be a little more sluggish. But mm. the comparison is always funny to me. Like if you were to take an F-16, a clean F-16, it's going to do very well in a dogfight against a lot of platforms. Yes. But the F-16 is never clean, right? It's never in combat clean is my point. Right. You're going to at least have pylons. Yeah, you're going to have pylons. You're going to have other weapons that are going to slow it down. Mm-hmm. You're going to have targeting pods and things that you're going to go into combat with. So the F-35 has all that internal and it is fairly effective. I'd give it a rating of a B and it was very similar to flying a strike eagle. You get one good G pull at the beginning, depending on your altitude, you know, you're able to rate effectively. It's fairly good at low speed, high angle of attack, unlike an F-16. And you can get into a tree. I mean, I've been into a tree and you know, trees, I don't know if your listeners, you know. I do, but the listener may not. So explain that very briefly. Yeah. So a tree would be really high angle of attack. Think of basically going as slow as you possibly can without falling out of the sky. So your nose is really high. Mm -hmm. You're in a tree to try to slow down and cause the other person to kind of fly out in front of you right? because they can't fly that slowly. The F-35 can do a tree fairly effectively. You know, you're talking low 100s, I can be in a tree. And, you know, the Hornet is probably lower than that. I think, what, 80, 90 knots, you could probably be in a good tree. Well, but you, you know, then you have rules for the training that you're doing that you generally don't want to get that slow because if you do depart, but yeah, I've seen it down to 90. I'd say it's effective. It's maneuverable. And All right. But come on, Cinco, saying that it's pretty good or as good isn't as salacious as saying, oh, look, we just spent all these billions of dollars and it's not even as good as this aircraft that's been around for 40 years. I mean, of course the media is going to love that story, even if it's not completely true. So, okay. But again, I think... Dare I say, uh, you know, the Top Gun bros are going to come take away my patch, but um, perhaps, dare I say, the era of BFM is over. I mean, if an F-35 is in a dogfight, it's probably done something wrong to get to that point. The pilots still need to know what to do, but that's not the point, I guess, is uh, is what I'm trying to say, is you shouldn't try to get there. Absolutely. And that kind of hits on this point of it changing what it means to be a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. I feel like before you were really trying to find a pilot that could, you know, task manage effectively, make decisive decisions, and very importantly, maneuver their aircraft in relation to another aircraft with snippets of information and good hand-eye coordination to make certain yeah. choices and you're pulling lots of Gs where you're able to do it. The F-35 is not necessarily like that. 
I mean, I remember in the F-15C, I would spend most of my time or probably half of my time looking outside and looking for either threats or other people in my flight, right? My wingman or my flight lead, whoever it was. So I would look inside and look at my radar and I'd look outside and find where they are. Then I'd look inside and I'd look at my radar warning receiver and I'd look outside and I'd look inside and look at my data links. And you would do this all, this whole back and forth thing. And you'd no longer do that in the F-35. One, you have all the information you need right in front of you about everyone around you. <laughs> so you no longer necessarily have that same what we call pucker factor of a midair collision, you know, with these other aircraft, because you, you have a lot of information in front of you and it's displayed in a very effective manner, but mm -hmm. you also have fusion. So instead of now me as a pilot looking at my radar and then my radar warning receiver, and then my data link to try to put together a picture, the system has done it all for me. On top of that, the aircraft is on autopilot most of the time, unless I'm dogfighting or having to maneuver, you know, aggressively. And I'm in auto throttle mode. Mm. So the throttle is doing what it needs to, to maintain whatever airspace that I needed to do. So the flying portion of it is not what it was when you were flying those other fighters, right? Yeah. You're managing the battle space and you have all this information. You're no longer flying within visual formation of other F-35s because you don't need to be. You want to be more spread out. Like in the F-15, you wanted to be close. You wanted to be a few miles away, which means you're visual and you're always looking for that visual, but no longer in the F-35. That's really interesting, Cinco. So when I left the Navy and went to the airlines, I remember having the epiphany of, I'm not really a pilot anymore. I'm an aircraft programmer mm -hmm. because we do manually take off and land the aircraft, although it can automatically land itself. But otherwise, the way you're flying is not with a yoke. It's with buttons and knobs and programming, hey, I want to go up to this altitude or I want to go this fast. And so I think to your point, you're right. The demographic, if you will, of a fighter pilot is changing from, let's say, Robin Olds, right? I mean, right. he is almost the quintessential devil may care, can't stand authority, loves to party, larger than life, get out there and just grunt and do it and pull G's and all that, to really now, dare I say, someone who's very analytical can understand the three-dimensional or four-dimensional with time, really, environment and program and make decisions. And it's not so much that you're employing the aircraft, but that you're employing an overall weapon system. Right. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. And so that's going to, I think, attract a different type of person yeah. because it's not just brawn like a rugby match. It's more of a chess match almost. Yeah. And when I was going through pilot training, it was very competitive to get fighters. And then... When you got fighters, 20% would wash out. So you'd get T-38s, which is kind of our advanced trainer, which is going to be replaced by the T-7 here shortly. Mm -hmm. But you get T-38s, and then you'd learn dogfighting in a T-38. And it was a training course that we called Introductions to Fighter Fundamentals, IFF. And 20% of the people would wash out of IFF wow. because they couldn't dogfight. And then you'd go to your fighter, and for me, you know, at 15Cs, 20% of those people would wash out, a lot of them because they couldn't dogfight. Hmm. My take of it is, well, maybe that shouldn't be the most important thing. Maybe we should be looking for these other people that can be more effective than necessarily the dogfighter. And if they can't dogfight, maybe that's something that we accept <laughs> because, you know, the other things they bring to the fight are actually more valuable for an F-35. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, well, this is now bar talk over a cold one because that sounds, dare I say again, if you look back to why Top Gun exists almost a sacrilege because part of the reason we got our butts kicked in early part of the Vietnam conflict is that we didn't have those skills. Right. But I think to your point, you know, and the, again, the retort would be, well, we thought the same thing about missiles, but you know, maybe air combat has changed and maybe these are skills people can learn later. And like you said, they still bring a lot of value. I mean, at that point, if you wash out of the F-15 RTU, I mean, for heaven's sakes, you've already done a lot of training. You're clearly good enough to get to that point. But if you're not good enough at dogfighting, is that grounds for separation? And it sounds like for right now it is, but we'll be interesting to see yeah. how that continues. Yeah. So. I think it's something for our tactical experts to yeah. at least bring into the equation as the F-35 kind of changes some of the landscape. Well, tactical experts and anyone who listens on YouTube to this episode, because we always get some very colorful uh, responses to various things. So we'll expect that. That's all right. All right, dude, let's move on to strengths and weaknesses. And we'll start with strengths. Is there one particular feature of the F-35 weapon system that just really is when you land is what puts a smile on your face or they just got it right? Well, <laughs> they did get it right, but it took 
a long time. Um, <laughs> and it is really just the information at your fingertips as a pilot is really phenomenal. Okay. So they got that right. But mind you, years ago, I was not a believer. I actually was very frustrated, as I'm sure most taxpayers were, of the way the program was going. I learned a lot as I programmatically got involved with the platform. And, you know, the computer system just wasn't stable. Hmm. If they wanted to take off, they would have to reset their aircraft over and over and over again. It would take hours for them to actually get just to a point where they could get airborne. Wow. The system wasn't stable. So back in like 2015, the time frame, the Lockheed Martin engineers finally got the system where it was stable. And with that stability came a dramatic increase in capability. They were able to start delivering and focusing their efforts instead of stability because they got that part right. Mm -hmm. They were able to focus on capability and it, it really came along. So the thing that always strikes me is the ability to take off as a you know four, eight, 10 ship, whatever it is. And just how much information you have about the battlefield, okay. right? Like I don't need the AWACS anymore telling me a lot of information. Like I have more information than they do, wow. which is really quite phenomenal. And I just- That is a game changer. Yeah, it really is. And, and the way that you can figure out with different sensors and different capabilities and a really advanced, you can figure out what is out in front of you on the air and in mm -hmm. the ground and then track people in the, on the air and in the air, part of me and on the ground. It's really eye opening. I've loved mm -hmm. that. I think that's definitely the strength. Cool. Is there one particular thing you wish for whatever reason they would fix that they didn't, whether it was budgetary or just program or something else, a weakness, if you will? A lot of it they've gotten after. Some of it hasn't been fixed yet, but I'm aware that they are fixing it. So I have a hard time calling out some of those things because I know that it is on like sure. the programmatic roadmap, even though it may not get to the warfighter in a few years. Okay. For me, I was very frustrated that they didn't have automatic ground collision avoidance in the system right away. And that's probably a whole other podcast, but that was very frustrating that they had the capability to have it in there and they just really didn't put it in there. It wasn't mm -hmm. a high enough priority. Now that's changed. They realized the error of their ways and they put it in and that's a huge thing, right? So I was very frustrated that it took so long to make that happen. Okay. And a side note, I think we had our first F-35 auto GCAS save like two, three weeks ago. Really? Yeah. So like I said, this really would be another podcast almost. Whenever we think there may be a save with auto GCAS, and typically that's an F-16 up until now, now the F-35, mm -hmm. we go evaluate as a, a service. We go evaluate if that no kidding was a save or not before we tell the world that we've saved an aircraft through this technology. Yeah. But we're being told by the pilot that the pilot thinks that it saved his life because he was going to die had it not gone off. Give us a 10 second summary of what auto GCAS yeah. is. So auto GCAS is automatic ground collision avoidance system. It basically is a system where the aircraft knows if it is going to hit the ground and at the last possible second takes control away from the pilot and saves the aircraft from hitting the ground. Okay. So if the pilot's incapacitated, maybe he's over G'd or had a head cold and just not as capable or is not paying attention, short of a catastrophic collision with the ground, it saves the day. Exactly. Wow. Fighter pilots for years and actually decades fought that system ever getting onto an F-16. Mm -hmm. And it took up until 2014 is when they finally got it on. And from 2000 to 2014, they lost 17 pilots due to ground collision. Oh, that could have been avoided with this system. They put it on the F-16 and 14. They've saved eight lives and seven aircraft and not had one ground collision with the system engaged because that's how effective huh. it is. But it took decades to convince the pilot community yeah. that this technology was good enough to kind of not be a nuisance and to save their life, which is frustrating. Yeah, it is. But it's such a paradigm shift too. And of course, families get involved because I've got to think the families of the 18 folks that were killed before that are upset that it wasn't implemented more quickly. But you're right. We'll have to uh, bring you back to talk about that, Cinco, because as I understand it, you've got a personal story on some of the other collision stuff. But let's wrap up with the F-35. How about notoriety? I guess one thing of notoriety is that if I read correctly, is this the most expensive military program in the history of military programs? Yeah. <laughs> I think it is. I mean, especially if you look at the roadmap and how long the F-35 is supposed to be viable for and how much money it's going to mm -hmm. require. 
over the next three decades, as well as just how many aircraft there are. I mean, 4,000, not quite, but nearly 4,000 aircraft is what the purchase is going to be. I think around 2,500-ish, somewhere like that for America, and then the rest are all foreign military. But mm. that procurement is just, that's crazy money, yeah. right? And then to get us there was very expensive and very time-consuming. Once again, primarily because of the capability we're wanting to bring about, but uh, nonetheless, very expensive. Sure. Well, and it's hard to know where some of that technology can be useful elsewhere. Right. Certain things we learn throughout history as we build weapons or weapon systems that are adaptable to other things, whether it's civilian infrastructure or other technologies. How about Hollywood? Has this aircraft made its way into any movies yet? Uh, I'm sure it's in one of the Transformers. That's a given. Oh, yeah. That's actually, it's funny you bring that up. I was in Transformers 5. <laughs> yeah, oh, I have a speaking part. <laughs> I've never even watched the movie. I mean, I, I probably shouldn't say that. You know, I... Um, <laughs> I had a buddy, we were up at Edwards Air Force Base, and I had a buddy that was approached by, I think, just PA, Public Affairs for the Air Force, said, hey, we need an F-35 pilot to go help out Michael Bay. And and so this buddy went down, and he did a great job and had his helmet, and he was like pretending to fly the F-35. And and they, a month later, called back up, and they're like, hey, can we get this guy to go down? But he was gone on a trip. Mm -hmm. So I was like the only available pilot, and I was like, well, I'll go down and help out with whatever F-35. And I bring all my gear, and they're like, no, no, actually, we need you to talk about Ospreys. <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't know anything about an Osprey. I'm not an Osprey <laughs> pilot. I sat in this room with Michael Bay for a few hours, and he directed me to say a line. But either way, yes, I'm still getting residuals, which is great. Yeah. Oh, check it <laughs> yeah. out. Do you have a page on IDMB or IMDB, I should, right? I think it is. I can become a Screen Actor Guild member or something because I have there a speaking role in a, a major motion picture. It was, yeah. yeah. Well, it's been in uh, the Transformers movies and there's been a number of other movies that the F-35 has kind of shown its... Well, and this thing, as you stated, is going to be around for a long time. I think they've built around 500 so far. Yeah, that's right. And uh, they're on their way to several more. And it's already operational, I believe. Yep. At least in the Air Force and the Marine Corps. I don't know if the Navy has deployed their first squadron yet. No, the Navy just declared initial operational capability in 2019. And they, yeah, they won't go operational, like full operational for a little bit. But yeah, the Marines and the Air Force have both used it in combat. Now, is there a particular flight or a uh, story that you can think of that uh, sticks out in your mind flying the F-35 or maybe someone you know of? I mean, for me, the F-35 flights are like these test flights where we're going to the corner of the envelope. So Mm -hmm. probably the the most dramatic one was we're testing the AIM-9X missile to make sure that it safely got away from the aircraft at the max G-force at lowest altitude and max speed. So we had to dive into this test point from, you know, 15,000 feet. We had to go up to Mm -hmm. 700 knots, which, you know, 800 plus miles an hour or so a little over 2,000 feet, do a brake turn to get to full G, and then press the pickle button and, and release the weapon while you're doing all that, which that's kind of the life of a test pilot, right? It's kind of crazy to think about it, but mm-hmm. it's this huge team effort. You build up, you do simulator missions beforehand. Even the day of, you build up in Gs and you make sure that you have everything right before you press that pickle button. Mm-hmm. So those type of missions, auto g so automatic ground collision avoidance testing was was interesting because you need to fly at a mountain and see if it's going to save you from hitting the mountain, right? So, you know, flying around at 100 feet, we tricked the system. We basically tricked the system into thinking that you're really not at the altitude you're at. You're a little bit different. Oh, good. But you can't trick it too much because the pressures, the densities are different. So you want to get as close as you can safely. So some of that testing can get, uh, let's just say, fun. And, you know, some of that, too, was nuisance testing with Auto GCAS, which was, uh, was a lot of fun, mm-hmm. where you would be doing low levels, but you'd be doing it at, at 100 feet. We'd be cleared down to 100 feet going, you know, five, 600 knots, mm-hmm. uh, making sure that the system didn't activate when you didn't want it to activate. So those are some of the ones that are kind of stand out. Did you ever have to depart it, like do spin training or anything like that? No, I got a part of the program flying when we had finished that, but I did some loads testing, which is a different type of testing where you Mm -hmm. do different G forces at different air speeds and altitudes, which is interesting. A lot of, uh, asymmetric G forces when we're doing that testing. So think of like, you're pulling back on the stick and going to seven G's, and then you're putting in while you're holding that a full roll stick input to see how the system asymmetrically rolls around its axis to make sure that, you know, there's no problem. So there's been some of that, which was always fun. Yeah, I can imagine. That's pretty cool. 
Well, this has been a lot of fun, Cinco, and I know we could probably go on and on about the F-35. What's the future hold for you? So you're at MIT. I mean, is there a chance you could come back and fly this thing later? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I I think I could. Uh, Right now, I am at MIT until June of this year, and then I'm looking to support the Air Force with a new artificial intelligence accelerator that they've put together, Ah. where it's at MIT, and there's a team of Air Force people here that's working with MIT and industry to solve problems for the Air Force using artificial intelligence. So I'm going to do that for at least a year, and then (laughs) we'll see what after that. Keep playing the game, huh? Yeah. Sweet. Well, our final question, as always, is how did someone come up with a call sign Cinco for Tucker Hamilton? Yeah. Oh, Cinco. Uh, Our call signs come primarily from, you know, stupid stuff that we do, which uh, is no exception. And I was a young wingman on the wing of my flight lead flying our F-15C, and we were doing offensive counter air. So we were sweeping out bad guys in front of us. Bad guys are just other people from our squadron flying F-15s, but they're emulating Mm -hmm. a bad guy, right? So we're flying downrange, and we shoot our missiles at the bad guys. And then we do a maneuver where we turn 90 degrees to the side just to defeat any missiles coming in at us. Mm -hmm. It's just a maneuver to try to, once again, defeat that threat. And then we turn back in. But based on where I was in the formation, I'm on, if you're listeners and you can imagine, I'm on the left wing of my flight lead and you turn left to do this and then you turn back in and go towards you know, the target area. But if you're on the left in that situation, like I was, you get slung out of position. So I'm aft and I'm back and and I'm like five miles away from my flight lead. And he's like, two, pause it. Where are you? I'm like, I'm at your left, you know, eight o'clock, five miles closing, which means I see you, I'm getting back in position. So I start getting back into position. 30 seconds go by. He's like, two, I still don't see it. Where you at? I'm like, uh, one, I'm at your left nine o'clock now two miles. So I'm, I'm kind of back in position where I need to be, but he still doesn't see me. Mm-hmm. And then he's like two, you know, 30 seconds go by. He's looking for me and I'm looking at him. He doesn't see me. So I move it in closer. He's like two, where are you? I'm like one, I'm at your left wing with a flash. So I start rocking my wings back and forth, you know, 20 seconds go by. He still doesn't see me. I get into like 3000 feet, which is way closer than you want to be. And I'm basically mm-hmm. staring at his helmet. I'm so close. And he's like, two, where are you? He's getting pissed <laughs> at me. And I'm like, one, I'm right off your left wing at 3,000 feet with the flash, which means I'm flashing my wings back and forth, flaring. So I start dropping flares. And there's a pause on the radio. And he's like, two, are you flying off one of the bad guys we just killed out? And I look down on a scope that I have, a data link, and I'm like 80 miles away from my flight lead. The guy that's staring at me was one of the bad guys we killed out. I never turned back in to go to the target area. I just rolled out from that initial left-hand turn, rolled out and started flying on this other guy's wing. He's shaking his head at me because he knows what's going on, but he can't say anything. Uh I throw it into five stages of afterburner, which is as fast as you can go in the F-15. There's different stages of afterburner. So five stages of afterburner, I rock it back to get back into position uh, because I want to be there to support the rest of the fight because I'm a moron because I'm out of position. And I rejoin on his (laughs) wing right as we're supposed to be over the target area for 15 minutes. And within about 10 seconds, I get my bingo light that goes off and I'm out of fuel because I pissed it all away trying to get back into position. So they called me Cinco for flying around in five stages of AB. (laughs) Yeah, you build a thousand bridges, right? But uh, (laughs) one time joining on the bad guy who's probably kill removing. Oh, that's awesome, Cinco. Well, bro, this has been a lot of fun, man. I want to thank you for your time. This has been a long one, but, you know, listeners have been asking for longer and longer episodes, and I have to tell them, well, I'm at the mercy of my guests and their time. So uh, this has been cool, and uh, maybe we'll have to bring you back, talk more about the Auto GCAS and and some of your other stories. You've certainly got a lot of experience. Uh, But any final thoughts on the F-35 today? No, I appreciate you letting me, uh, you know, come and share cool. uh, this platform. It, it's tough because I'm definitely not um, trying to sell it, but I do believe in it. And I've been a part of it for very long. So I've seen the good and I've seen the bad. And I think for the most part, we're getting it right. And, and it is actually important for national defense. All right, Cinco. Well, thanks very much for your time today. And uh, we'll catch you later. All right. Many thanks once again to Cinco Hamilton for sharing his time and expertise with us. Chip. I thought that was an insightful discussion, and I have a few points I want to discuss with you. But first off, what were your thoughts overall? Yeah, he's got such a cool background. And I think what I enjoyed the most 
you know, is the two different components that where he came from and his background. And it had such a, a unique start because unlike most of us and probably like you and me, he was never really interested in flying, <laughs> you know, and I kind of started out the first few minutes. I'm thinking, wow, where's where this thing going, man? I um, know. You know, he just represented a different upbringing and a, a different approach and, you know, a different life experience to get to where he is. And then found himself, I think, like we all did, doing a job that we all came to love, but just got there in a, in a very different way. I think the story about him being able to fly despite his initial vision concerns was really cool. And then to find himself in the test world and the F-35 world, man, he's got some really, really cool insights. I know they, the, your listeners enjoyed it, but boy, what a valuable perspective to kind of counter what, what an operational perspective would be. You put it together, you got a guy there who's extremely solid with his Eagle background, operational experience and test experience. Uh, what a great dude, man. What a cool interview. Well, for sure. And that's why it took so long to get this interview is we were looking for someone with experience in all three models, which is not terribly common. No, it's not at all. We totally scored with him. He was a definitely a, a good find. So I recorded this several months ago, and I listened to it again to prepare for my discussion with you. And as I sometimes do, I take a piece of paper and I divide it into columns and I wrote, wow, and more. And in the wow category, yeah, you're right. I have no dream of flying. Dude, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, there are young people out there listening right now that are getting their pitchforks and torches ready because that's, that's right. <laughs> all they want. Another one is that he married his boss. I thought that was a fun one. <laughs> and then, yeah, the eye trouble, specifically depth perception, I didn't think... I thought that was a no-go, but... Uh, I did too. Yeah, I absolutely did. I thought that was just an immediate... And so I wonder if there's maybe a little more component to that. And I don't want to yep. give a bunch of people false hope that you don't need to have depth perception. I think you do. <laughs> but it, it may have been a, you know, a nuanced thing that maybe they opened up you know, ever so slightly the requirements that allowed him to get in. So right. pretty cool story. Totally. The other thing was the $400,000 helmet. Did you have one of those? I did. I had one of the early versions of that. Wow. Um, and, you know, they've made some really nice improvements since the original round that we got mm -hmm. uh, out of the gate. But yes, that is an expensive piece of gear. And then if I remember it correctly, the distributed aperture system, I remember hearing about this. Weren't early test pilots like getting sick because they were like looking down through their own body or effectively? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we call that the DAS, the distributed aperture system. And that's a really cool, a really awesome technology that initially had just a, a little bit of issues trying to patch together the six different scenes. Okay. And it created some seams. And there were some frame rate issues. There were some very minor issues. And a few mm. pilots indeed had a little trouble kind of physiologically adapting to it. I think if you would talk to anybody now in retrospect, it was actually a pretty painless transition, just took a little getting used to. And they made some really cool, very simple software fixes to to make that thing work. And now it's a system that I think guys would tell you that they wouldn't imagine getting in an airplane without it now. So mm. some small growing pains, nothing too critical, but yeah, at first it was, it's pretty bizarre. Uh, you know, the old joke is, you know, you drop your pencil and you want to reach down and grab it and you're looking at the ground instead of looking at the <laughs> floorboard. So it can take a little getting used to of kind of tilting your head up and looking down through your eyes right. to get used to the desk. It's an awesome, awesome system, man. And it's not just something you're going to go wear in the F-18 or F-16, because obviously you have to have all the system built onto the aircraft to go with it. Yeah, yeah. And those cameras are embedded into the skin of the airplane. It's pretty neat. It's a really cool system. All right, man. Well, so in my more category on my piece of paper, there are a couple of things that I wrote down, and this is where I'd like to drop anchor with you. Yeah, Jeff. yeah. Now, first off, off subject though a little bit, Cinco had some ALO experience and you had some Anglico experience. I wonder, if, is there some parallels there or are they totally different? Uh, well, no, they're not totally different. I don't know Cinco well enough to know what he did specifically as an ALO. An ALO, and I worked with several and they have some overlapping stuff. An ALO, in my experience, what they have done in their liaison role is they are a coordinator between getting the assets and the folks that will use the assets and being a, a liaison to make that happen. Really critical role. The ALOs that I work with, and I don't believe, in, and again, some of your listeners may have a different experience, so I'm not going to uh, say with 100% certainty, but the, an ALO is not a JTAC. So he's not out there as a controller, doesn't have a qualification to control air. Uh. An ALO is different than a JTAC or a FAC. So I would uh, not expect to have stories from most ALOs where they're doing FAC-related missions. I think there are some folks that have been ALOs that were also JTACs, but I think in this case, he was working the coordination between assets and people, as opposed to controlling the aircraft themselves in, in a tactical way, based on my experience. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I just wasn't sure. And for anyone who's wondering about Chip's experiences with Anglico, you can go back and find episode 59 from the fall of 2019. And we talk all about that. It was a great discussion. Okay, what about the canopy opening, quote, the wrong way? Is there <laughs> yes. any practical consequences of that? 
Uh, no, it, like with anything, I think it falls in the category of the first couple times you do it, it's different. And of course, if it's different, it's immediately weird. And if it's weird, it's immediately wrong. And we have these immediate emotional reactions. Mm -hmm. And I would say that after like the second flight, I never paid attention to it ever again. Okay. It has an odd look to it. And certainly when you see the canopy pop up and I'm from the ground, but it falls again into the category of no factor. Just seems like it might be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's an interesting point you make because when you do something else long enough, anything that's not that is effectively queer. I mean, that, yeah. you, you, you're it's like, different. no, this isn't right. And exactly. And so humans are resistant to change, but you can adapt fairly quickly, especially if that's all it is. And after a few flights, that's what you could do. All right. Hey, so this next couple subjects are where I expect, again, the pitchforks and the torches uh, from the old bros <laughs> to come around. So quote, change what it means to be a fighter pilot and the whole idea of dogfighting. And again, that is why Top Gun exists, because we all thought that right over the horizon radar, well, not quite over the horizon, but beyond visual range radar and missiles, we're going to do away with dogfighting. So as service, we got away from that and we got spanked for it in the early years of the Vietnam conflict. Is it safe, though, to say, well, this is different because now we didn't know the information and now we have global SA? I mean, what do you think? Is this the end of dogfighting or, or not? Well, look, man, I think that you anchoring on this is actually very important, not just for your listeners, but for all of us as we contemplate what the future of how an aircraft integrates in battle space. And if you think you're calling on folks to get out the pitchforks, I've been talking this for, you know, coming up on 10 years now. And believe me, I've alienated a lot of folks with some of those initial opinions. <laughs> I actually thought the way you talked to him in the interview, you did a really nice job. You made a, what appeared to be a subtle comment, but it's actually very important is, hey, look, first and foremost, we still teach dogfighting. You talked to that, you know, very briefly, the comment you made. Mm -hmm. So I don't want people to think that this is kind of a, a binary, we either do or we don't. And we teach dogfighting for a whole bunch of different reasons. Some is it helps you get really good and comfortable in how the airplane maneuvers. It gives you a sense of what the envelope feels like. You know as well as anyone that teaching dogfighting is a critical foundation to allow us to just become good pilots no matter what the environment is. Agreed. But we also teach dogfighting in case we have to get into a dogfight. And so it's a skill set that we continue to train to. And I think there's folks that have incredible mastery of it. The corollary to that is it most certainly is very different than it used to be. Now, it doesn't mean that you will never see one airplane against another airplane again in a dogfight. But the era of sort of mass visual engagements is most certainly over. Mm -hmm. And you made an illusion as well that if you're in an F-35, that you find yourself in a visual engagement, that you've done something wrong. A lot of people take that as like, oh, well, you can't rely on stealth. You can't be sure that you won't get to attorney engagement. You can't be sure that you won't be dogfighting. True. You can't be sure. That's why we train to it. But it doesn't just mean that you made a mistake because your systems didn't work correctly or that possibly, um, you know, you didn't know what was going on and, and an enemy found themselves in a visual environment. The most more important thing is where we fly airplanes now, where we take our tactical jets and we put them in three-dimensional battle space, the last thing I would ever want to do is get as slow as the airplane can possibly go, <laughs> cover the least amount of ground, be visually evident to everybody out airborne and every system on the ground, and expose myself to the risk of all the other elements out there that can create a problem for me. Dogfighting is a tactical error in almost every way, shape, or form. So we avoid dogfighting for a whole bunch of reasons. And as a matter of fact, the systems in our aircraft are designed to prevent us from having to do that. Does it mean that we're never going to dogfight again? No, but we came from an era where we didn't have any mission systems and didn't have any aircraft systems that allowed us to avoid a dogfight. So our objective was to ensure that when we get to a dogfight, we're in a dominant position. And that led to BVR and some other things. We are so far down that path that it's something that we should avoid almost at all costs because the likelihood of surviving and the risk of mm -hmm. being in a dogfight is incredibly high. And if I'm in a stealth airplane, I want to maximize all the other capabilities if I did get in a returning fight in an F-22 and an F-35, I'm extremely confident, extremely confident that I'd be successful because we trained to it. But is the era of dogfighting over? It's been over for a while. It doesn't mean we don't train to it. It doesn't mean you don't need a gun. Yeah. But this is not the era we're in anymore. <laughs> get out your pitchforks. Dude, no, that I'm just sitting here thinking, what can I possibly add to that? I don't think there's anything else, man. That was uh, well said. So I could summarize what you just said, but I won't waste everyone's time. That was good stuff, Chip. Thanks very much. Right on. Okay. Tell me about the autopilot. He said the autopilot on most of the time. And again, in my airliner, 
it's pretty much on from when I push it on at about 10,000 feet until yeah. about a thousand feet above landing. Is the F 35, something similar where when you're just tooling around, it's mostly on or. Yeah. And I think what he's getting at is that there's a ton of pilot relief in the F 35. Now, interesting, you know, his background. Okay. So I flew the Raptor, I flew the F 16 and I flew the Hornet prior to my F 35 experience. The Hornet has still compared to those other airplanes and definitely compared to other platforms out there as well has some really good pilot relief. So I had a little thought there that maybe his connection to pilot relief and autopilot from his Eagle days may have been a little different than how easy it was that we had it in the Hornet with the bear out hold, the rat out hold, all the really cool things. Okay. You know, he flew Strike Eagles, I think had some much more advanced stuff there. I didn't use, and I don't think most guys tactically are using the pilot relief quite like you would say with an airliner. Okay. But in terms of like flying the airplane, most certainly most of the time you're letting the airplane do its thing and you're doing other things that includes really good auto throttle system, even better than the Hornet, as good as that was, mm. and some good pilot relief modes, but not what I would consider sort of a revolution departure from what you and I had and like a really nice high lot hornet in the way it did it in there. Okay. So that was just my perspective on that. Maybe a little different than Cinco's, but not like crazy different. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I just wasn't sure if the how, if you will, was flying the thing most of the time and you had to like, hey, I want to take it for a little bit kind of thing. But yeah, yeah. What you're saying makes sense. Something else though that Cinco said that really resonated with me was more info than the AWACS. Yeah. Now that's mind blowing. And again, this thing is a game changer, right? more info. I mean, cause you remember the early days in the F-18, dude, you went out with your soda straw and you moved it oh, yeah. left and right up and down to try to build a picture pixel by pixel. But now you're talking, sounds like global SA. Yeah. You know, I could talk for a long time here. I have a bad habit of talking a lot. So I'm trying to keep this one <laughs> succinct, but his comment is really, it's spot on and it's really hard, certainly for non-aviators, but even for a lot of pilots to really get their head wrapped around that. If you were to just take all the sensors on an F-35, and I can't say what the bandwidth is and what the range is. I'm not going to tell you what they cover, but if you were just take all the sensors and kind of draw them out on like how far they would reach and how wide in the band they would reach and what bands they're in and lay them down and compare them to any other fighter in the world, F-35 to anything else, to include the F-22, the amount of available information in different bands, in different bandwidths, and in different regimes, it is infinitely greater in an F-35. You have so much more information. And then through Fusion, you're sharing and collaborating with all the other airplanes out there. It is impossible if you are a fourth gen perspective to understand without seeing it from the inside, Mm. how much more awareness that you have. I think that's part of the reason why he used that phrase the way that he did. It's because we always think of the AWACS as being the tool that we need to give us the information outside of our relatively narrow bandwidth that we get from our RF machine. We call it a radar. The F-35 is is EO, IR, electro-optical laser fused with dozens of other airplanes sometimes. It's incredible how much information you have. And that's part of the reason why the airplane is so often misunderstood by people who don't know it that well. And part of the reason why Cinco did such a good job describing going from a 4th gen platform to a 5th gen platform is it exposes you to things you simply don't know that exist in a tactical fighter. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not to say that an AWACS is not a viable and critical tool that we have. It's incredibly valuable. It helps us do things that you certainly couldn't always do and or would want to do in an F-35. But in my cockpit, and I saw this in the Raptor, and I saw it in F-35, you know, even expanded, when I went out and did operational missions, in the Nellis Tress range or the Fallon range or wherever I was operating, we routinely and almost never utilized an offboard uh, system like an AWACS. And when we did, we never relied on the information they passed because we had so much more high fidelity information. A, a four ship of Raptors does not need an AWACS wow. uh, to conduct missions. Now, again, it's not to imply the AWACS isn't valuable. It can do some incredible things outside of band, mm-hmm. connect with other assets. It performs a critical function, but it's not the same function you would think in your Hornet, like, okay, initial picture. Hey, AWACS, tell me what's going on and I'll go from there. Mm-hmm. And so that reliance on those offboard systems uh, is totally different in the fifth chain. And there's no nothing close to an F-35. It's not even close. Wow. And that's part of the reason why when I hear the argument between F-35 and anything else, having flown them all, it's it's kind of laughable. It's, it's how much of a disparity there is. Well, and something you said really resonated with me is if you haven't done it, you don't know. Yeah. And so that's exactly the case for me. I mean, I topped out at the F-18. And so it's just not possible to imagine what 
is just unfathomable. Yeah, well, so. listen, man, for me to just say you'll have to just trust me because I did it is a really below average <laughs> communication on my part. It implies that I'm not capable of explaining it well enough. And so I hate the idea that I'm supposed to just tell you, hey, you just got to trust me because I've done it. <laughs> and I really hope that's not how it's coming across. And really more than anything, it's the exposure to systems that live in a not in an unclassified world. And I kind of chuckled when he was kind of, Cinco was kind of maneuvering around some of your questions as well. There is a part of me that just has to say, hey, rather than just telling you to trust me, I can say, based on my experience, and look, I got a lot of experience in these machines, you know, seven yes, you plus years flying Raptors and F-35s and, you know, however many, you know, a dozen or so years with the Hornet and the F-16, the disparity is overwhelming. And for him to say more info than an AWACS doesn't surprise me at all, but it's a really tough pill to swallow if you don't understand it. Yeah. And me personally, don't do a great job sometimes explaining how and why that is. Uh, so hopefully I did it. I did a little bit better job, but I still, it's probably not good enough yet, but <laughs> I'll keep working on it because I know the truth. No, that was good stuff, Chip. Uh, you're spot on as far as I'm concerned. And then the last thing in my more category here was, I find it interesting, and I think I understand it, but I wonder if you could explain, why do you think pilots are resistant to the auto GCAS? Yeah, I have good opinion, strong opinion about this too. I loved that Cinco talked about this. So I did yeah. auto GCAS testing in the Raptor as part of uh, my experience as an operational test guy. So I was not a test pilot. I was not a DT guy. I did not go to test pilot school, mm -hmm. but I did some operational testing, which basically after the test community is with it, before they give it to the fleet, they have, you know, regular fighter pilots like me fly these missions to see how the fleet is going to do with these post-developmental systems. One of the things I got to do is fly a bunch of auto GCAS missions with the Raptor in preparation for that system. System. I'll start by saying this. Auto GCash should be on every airplane in the world. The thing is unbelievable. The pros outweigh the cons infinitely. And the reason why I think there's a little bit of resistance is every now and then there are some regimes that which the pilot can maybe uh, transiently and briefly enter in a mode or a, a flight regime that the auto GCash might kick in, push the airplane, give you an alert, maybe nudge the nose or start to maneuver when you know, is right on borderline of the algorithm telling you where you're going to be. And, and guess what pilots don't like? Pilots don't like, especially single seat pilots, don't like other people telling us what to do. I don't know if you ever have this in the Hornet, but every now and then, you know, the higher lot Hornet's coming across the ship, just as you approach the ramp, sometimes that little rat out sync indicator would give you that, remember the thing would pop up on the arrow in the HUD and say, pull up, pull up, yes. or power, power. And it was in a little anomaly. It happened once in a blue moon. Mm -hmm. But when it did, especially in close at the ramp, you would add power kind of subconsciously and might even push you into the four wire or a bolter. And do you remember how frustrating that feeling was? Oh yeah. And it was that sense of, hey man, I don't want anybody or anything telling me what to do. Well, the reality is, is that auto GCAS exists to prevent pilots from flying airplanes in the ground. I'm really glad Cinco talked to some of those statistics and the statistics are just continue to grow. And anybody that's been a beneficiary of the system that has saved their life and then looking back and knowing how long it took us to get these things on there, yes, pilots don't like, and every now and then there's a little transitory pushback from the system trying to tell us when maybe we actually had it covered, but that's actually not what this is about. Yeah. I am a huge, huge believer in the system. I love having that system. I relied on that system, and I believe that system will save airplanes and save lives. It'll be something that every pilot will come to grow and love, and the resistance was kind of born out of maybe some other reasons that really had nothing to do with the big picture. So again, yeah. you can get out your pitchforks. I got strong opinions on that one too, <laughs> but I'm a believer in that system, and I'm really glad Cinco described it the way he did. He was spot on with that explanation. Yeah. No, I agree. And I think it probably is a similar, oh, what would you call it? Progression that drivers went through as cars became more advanced because oh, first you had, example. right, analog brakes, and then you had oversteer protection, and then you had traction yeah. control, which is probably the same thing. And if you're just a day-to-day -day mom and pop driver, all those things are going to help you. But if you're a race car driver where you can dive it into the last second mm -hmm. and then do the things you need to do for a, a lap record, well, maybe those controls are going to impede you at a certain spot like you alluded to with the auto GCAS. But for the most part, the gains are definitely worth the few drawbacks because again, I forget the numbers suddenly, but it's saving lives and it's saving airplanes. And What's not to like about that? Jello, that's a great analogy. My Chevy Tahoe puts me back in the lane sometimes without me doing it on my own, and I get a little annoyed. <laughs> I'm like, oh, actually, the car just saved my life. Maybe I shouldn't be so annoyed. Good to go. Yeah, that's spot on. Well, good shout out for Chevy there. So yeah, good stuff. All right. Right on. I didn't have anything else on my list. Was there anything else that uh, he covered you thought of? No, I chuckled because when I saw what you were going to talk about, I think you're saying all the same things are in my mind, man. Cool. That was great. 
Well, the only other thing I had written down was that listeners have asked for it anyway, but I think based on my discussion with Cinco, we might need to do a future episode on X planes and Y planes because some of those prototypes and early models, are they can be pretty colorful in their own ways, including some of the yeah. <laughs> funky stuff that's out there, like the Ford swept wings on an F-16, whatever it was. And Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah the canards on that one F-15 that they put forward of the intake. So they got all kinds of crazy stuff. So I bet you got some good guys out there that you could talk to that have some really cool insights on that. Well, just got to find those folks. But yeah, we'll definitely look for that. All right, cool. Well, hey, before we wrap up today, I want to thank our new Patreon supporters, including Strike Leads, Brian Ketchum, Steve Matheson, Tom Lytle, Darren Gregory, Daniel Hassett, Jordan Miller, Abraham Jumadi, Anthony Lombardo, and Michael Maddox. We also have a new mission commander, Brian Brake, and a new air boss, Wayne Curry. And Chip, these guys all pitch in. They help out with the show financially, and they get some cool perks on the side. So we just want to give those guys a shout out. Right on. We also want to mention Patreon supporter Caleb Payne's kids, including baby Ike. Get well soon there, little buddy. All right. As a reminder, the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Chip, I want to thank you for taking the time to return to the show and lend your expertise today. It's always a pleasure, buddy. Dude, thanks for having me on again, man. I hope your listeners aren't getting tired of me, but I'm having a blast every time you have me on. (laughs) No, glad to do it. You always add a lot of value. So we thank you for that. And that'll do it for this week then. Thanks for tuning in. Take care of yourselves during these challenging times. Be good to one another. And we'll see you all next time here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Check us out at our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to share us with your network. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.